It certainly is great to be here this morning to continue to worship our Father in heaven. Thank you for being here this morning. May God bless each and every one of you. Hopefully everybody had a great weekend and is ready for a new week as we uh, continue our study and our worship uh, to God. To those who are visiting, we have a great crowd here tonight. Thank you for, or this morning, thank you for being here. And if you have any Bible questions, let us know. And if you're ever interested in a Bible study, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to word of God with you. In just a moment, we're going to dive into our lesson. I want to encourage everybody, if you can, come back tonight. And my mic is kind of going in and out, so put this mic on just in case. I want to encourage everyone to come back tonight. We're going to have a, a study from the Old Testament, and I'm going to give you an assignment. I haven't really done this before. We're going to be studying from First Chronicles chapter 21. And there we see David where he numbered the people. It's got to be one of the most fascinating studies. I want you to read that this afternoon. Don't read it now because we're getting ready to do a lesson here. But read it when you go home and then come back because you probably will have some questions. And so we're in the last month of the year. We only have a few more weeks before 2019. Let's do all we can to be at all the worship services. And uh, there's going to be a, a great study tonight from the Word of God in First Chronicles chapter 21 that I think will challenge us and at the same time help us in our walk with God. It's also good to see our new sister in Christ, Valeria, here along with her husband, Pablo. Uh, Valeria put on Christ a couple of weeks ago, and what a blessing uh, you are, the both of you guys, to this congregation, and uh, we're so thankful for you. Let's continue to rejoice uh, with our new sister in Christ, and let's encourage her uh, along the way. Well, I mentioned in Bible class, and I just mentioned a moment ago um, that we only have a month left. The year is almost over. And every year about this time, we typically say the same thing. I can't believe that the year is almost over. Where did time go? And it really has gone by fast. And because this is December 2018, this is our last month of talking about this theme that we began in January, becoming more like Christ. I appreciate the elders who put this theme together along with Ken at the beginning of the year of becoming more like Christ. It certainly is a, a challenging thought, and yet it's something that we are supposed to be. We're all under construction as Christians, and indeed we are to become more like Christ. I want to ask you guys a question. Do you remember what we first talked about in January? You remember what that first of the Spirit was that we first uh, looked at in January. If you don't, I'm going to put it on the slide. We talked about love, and we've talked about so much this past year. We, we talked about love, and we talked about joy, and peace, and patience, and self-control, and yielding to God, and so much more, and we've been making our way through the fruit of the Spirit, like with kindness, and, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and moral excellence. And we've done a number of sermons, over 20 sermons sermons so far uh, talking about these variety of, of fruit of the Spirit and, and virtues that we are to have. And we could talk about this every, every sermon. We could talk about this every Bible class, and it still wouldn't be enough. It's something that we're going to have to continue to do on our own and continue to grow in our walk with Jesus Christ. God indeed wants us to become like Him. You know, fathers here recognize, uh, we hear this phrase sometimes, like father, like son. And that's often a compliment when someone says, man, your son is just like you, like father, like son. And that certainly is what we are to be going after. God is our heavenly father, and we need to become more like him. And certainly, we need to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Why are we going after all of this? What is our, what is our motivation? What is our, our why? Jesus reminded us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 that in all the things that we do, we want to give him glory. That's our why. That's why we're striving to increase in love and become, uh, have a life more of, of discipline and self-control and truly yielding ourselves to God and submitting to him. That's what we're going after. And my friends, that's what we continue to need to keep our minds upon as we wrap up 2018 and as we go into 2019. So we began with love, and this morning, or this month rather, we're going to conclude with being merciful. And that's what our, that's what our thoughts are going to be on today, this idea of being merciful. If you have your Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse number 17. Hebrews chapter 2 has been on my mind, or Hebrews as a whole, because we've talked about it in the Sunday morning class, we've talked about it in the Wednesday night class, and there's something here that we need to remember about our Savior, Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, 
the Hebrew writer said, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become, listen to this, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make uh, propitiation for the sins of the people. We are reminded that our Savior Jesus indeed is merciful just as our Father in heaven is. And we're going to be focusing on this idea of being full of mercy. That's what James said in James chapter 3, that we ought to be full of mercy. And to do this, to kind of guide our thoughts this morning, I want to go back to a passage that we looked at when we were talking about kindness and when we were talking about goodness. That passage is Luke chapter 6. And we're going to learn from our Savior. We're going to sit at his feet this morning and see what he has to say and what we need to remember when it comes to us being merciful. In Luke chapter 6, we're going to begin our reading here in Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 27. And we'll move down to or read down to verse number 36. Remember the words of Jesus here in Luke 6, beginning at verse number 27. Jesus said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? But for even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. You see what he's talking about? He's talking about loving one another, loving everyone and doing good and being full of, of kindness. And I want you to notice what he says as he begins to wrap up this thought. In verse 35, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Now watch this. And you will be sons of of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That is powerful right there, of loving individuals and being kind and being good and also being merciful. We're to do good even when others may not do good towards us. We are to love even when others may hate us. And we are to be merciful even when others may not demonstrate the mercy that God wants them to have. To be merciful is to be compassionate, to take pity. This idea of loving kindness, certainly it is associated with forgiveness. It is the act of goodwill in both words and deeds. It's a quality that everyone in the kingdom of God must have. That's what Jesus said not only here in Luke chapter 6, but also in Matthew 5 and verse number 7. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It is a blessing, and this is who Jesus Christ wants me to be and wants you to be. We are to be merciful. And I want to just think about a couple of thoughts from verses 35 and 36. Those two verses are going to give us our outline for our study this morning as we talk about this idea of being merciful. The first thought I want you to think about as we continue to develop our, our faith in Jesus Christ is that we need to remember some things about our Father in heaven. Notice what Jesus said again in verse number 35. You go back to Luke chapter 6. He said, And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Think about that for a second. Jesus is saying that the Father... This is your motivation as well, that you be merciful because kind, God is kind to ungrateful and evil men. I just want to go through a quick journey through the Bible. Go back to the beginning in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Look over in Genesis chapter 3. And what I want you guys to see, and this includes me, is that in every age we see the mercy of God on display. That in every age, even when people disobeyed him, that we still see his kindness and his goodness. And when you go back to the beginning, you see that God was merciful even to Adam and Eve. Now, I think many of us, if not most of us, may be familiar with the story. That in the beginning, God created everything, and everything was what? Good. Everything was good. It was perfect. They lacked nothing. 
And I don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden. Hopefully I'll find that out when I get to heaven. But I know this, that everything was perfect and they had everything they needed. And yet in the process of time, we see that they would become disobedient to God. And I think it's safe for us to say that indeed Adam and Eve were ungrateful. Would you agree with that? If you have everything, if you have perfection, what is it that you're lacking? And yet the devil was able to deceive them into thinking, listen, you still are missing something. And I think it's safe for us to say that just as Jesus said, they were ungrateful and evil men, and yet God still would show mercy for them. When you read the story of Adam and Eve, and you go back to the garden, what we find, we still see the love of God. Yes, they were punished. Yes, sin brings about consequences. And yet we still see God's love for them. He still cared for them. And he would still be merciful, merciful uh, towards them. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, the Bible said, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. He gave them the things that they would now need. And he would still be with them even though they truly did not deserve his love and his compassion. Despite their wickedness, God was merciful to them. And there's a great psalm that I think helps us to see this mercy of God throughout the ages. I want you to turn over real quickly to Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, the Israelites, they recognized the mercy of God. In Psalm 103, in verse number 10, listen to what David said here. In Psalm 103, in verse number 10, David said, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. I think we see this idea of of mercy there. Adam and Eve didn't really deserve chance. They didn't deserve God still caring for them and providing for them, and yet they still received his mercy. In every age, God has been kind. He's been merciful to ungrateful and evil men. And speaking about the Israelites, let's talk about them for a second. When you look in the Old Testament, what do we see? Again, we see God showering the nation of Israel with blessings. He gave them everything. He made them their or his special people. And yet in the process of time, while many of them loved the Lord and and did his will, many times, over and over again, we see that they would often become disobedient. And yet there was no mistake that the Israelites could ever have in thinking that God was not merciful towards them, that God did not truly love them. He made this abundantly clear. I'm reading now in in, uh, Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus chapter 34, listen to how God described himself as he was talking to Moses in Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. There could never be a mistake for the Israelites. And, And thinking, does God really care about us? They knew from the very beginning that God truly cared about them. And in Exodus 34, verse and seven, God said, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. God made it very clear that he loved them and that he's full of compassion and that he is full of mercy. Yet what would happen? The Israelites, they often abused God's grace and his mercy. And yet he would still be compassionate towards them. He would still be merciful towards them when they had a heart of repentance. I'm turning over to Judges chapter 3. The book of Judges is powerful because we find that after Joshua died, as the people had received the land that God had promised to them, It wouldn't take long for them to become unfaithful to God. And they'd go through these cycles of of wickedness and sin. You could say that they were ungrateful and evil men. And yet we still see that God still loved them. And he still was merciful towards them. In Judges chapter 3 and verse number 10, and Judges chapter 3 rather in verse number 12, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and defeated Israel, and they possessed the city of the palm trees. The sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Now, in verse number 18, or verse number 15, rather, we see that when they cried out to the Lord, when they recognized their sinful behavior, God would hear their cries. 
and God would be merciful towards them. He would rescue them. And this is what we see all throughout the nation in this history of the Israelites. God loved them. He was kind to them. They didn't deserve his kindness. They were a small nation. And they were not great because of who they were or what they had accomplished. They were great because of God. And God wanted them to see how much he truly loved them. He was compassionate towards them. He was kind to them, even though they were often wicked and evil men. And yet, despite his mercy, despite his grace, they still would take God for granted. And in the process of time, they would be taken into Babylonian captivity. Earlier this year, we studied from the book of Ezekiel. Turn back to Ezekiel chapter 16. In Ezekiel chapter 16, this just gives us a a brief snapshot of the mindset that the Israelites had. And we're also going to see the mindset of God, that despite their wickedness, he still loved them. If they were willing to return to him, he would forgive them. He would show mercy to them. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse number 28, the prophet He said, moreover, you played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. You see, he's reminded them that they had a covenant relationship with God. And they should have been satisfied, very much like Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had everything. They should have been satisfied, but they weren't. And so he said, you played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. You played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. You also multiplied your harlotry with the land of merchants, Chaldea. Yet even with this, you were not satisfied. They were ungrateful and they were evil in nature. And despite all the showers of blessings that God had given them, they still weren't satisfied. And so there would be consequences. They would be taken into captivity. They were already there in Babylon. And they would remain there for a long period of time. Yet even throughout that, we see the love and the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of God. Look over in Ezekiel chapter 37, and again, let's look at verses 11 through 14. Ezekiel chapter 37, by this time, Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple is destroyed. The people have no hope. Now they recognize we really are in trouble. And God would remind them in their darkest hour, I still love you. I still care about you, and I'm going to be with you. I'm going to provide the things that you need. In Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse number 11, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own, in, on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. He's reminding them, I, I still love you. And I'm going to be merciful to you. And you're going to be able to go back home one day. And things are still going to be okay because I'm with you. They did not deserve any of that. They didn't deserve any of that. They played the role of a harlot. They committed adultery against God. Yet he says, I still love you. And I'm going to be merciful to you. I think that's what David is getting at when you go back and read Psalm 103 and verse number 10. And if anyone knows about the, knew about the mercy of God, it would be King David because he recognized just how good God really is. And that's why he said, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God was so good to Adam and Eve. And he was so good to Israel, despite them being ungrateful and evil men. But it wasn't just with the Israelites. God has shown God has been loving and merciful even to the Gentiles. Even in the Old Testament, you know, sometimes people have questions. What about the Gentiles? Did God love the Gentiles? They didn't have the law of Moses. They weren't his special people. Did he not care about them? Did he just kind of ignore them and just say, no, you know, they have no hope? No, he didn't do that at all. You think about Rahab in, in, the, in, in the book of Joshua. God certainly cared about Rahab, and she wasn't a Maybe the biggest example is that with the story of Jonah and the Ninevites. If you know history, and if you're familiar with the nation of Assyria, then you know that the nation of Assyria, they were a wicked nation. 
And Jonah, he's called to go to Nineveh to proclaim the word of God and to get these individuals to repent. You remember how he responded? He said, no, I don't want to do that. Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? Was he just too tired? Was his his schedule just too busy? You see, he knew something about God. What did he know? He knew that if they listened and repented, God would be merciful. And that bothered him. And that shows us how far off we are really from God. We think we have it all figured out. And we think sometimes, oh, I'm, I'm just so good. I'm so merciful. But we see Jonah, an Israelite, a prophet of God. And he, had so, he still struggled with this mindset. Look at Jonah chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city at three days' walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now watch this. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from them, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. And he's going to get his people to repent. He said in verse number nine, who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds... That they turned from their wicked way. Then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. You would have thought Jonah would have been jumping up and down. Giving people high fives. That's what a prophet wants. They proclaim the word of God and, they, and people listen. These people listened. And he couldn't be more furious. In chapter 4 and verse 1, but it greatly displeased Jonah. And he became angry, the nerve of him. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Had Jonah lost his mind? I don't want to give them this message because I know you're going to forgive them. I know you're going to be merciful to them. Jonah had a heart problem, and God was going to help him out. He said in verse number 11, Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? Jonah, this is who I am. I'm kind, and I'm, uh, and I'm good, even to those who are often ungrateful and wicked. And if they will listen, and if they will turn, indeed, I will forgive them. You see, in every age, whether it's with Adam and Eve, with, whether it's the Israelites, whether it's the Gentiles, God has always shown mercy to mankind. And his greatest display of mercy was when he sent his son to die on the cross. He shows us through that sacrifice just how much he truly loves mankind. In John chapter 3, in verse number 16, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that includes you and me, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, this is how rich God truly is when it comes to his mercy. We see his love. We see his goodness, his kindness to those who are evil and ungrateful to the point that he would send his son to die for us. We don't, deserve, we don't deserve the blood of Jesus. And yet he would die for us. We have experienced God's mercy through the sacrifice of his son. We said this in Bible class. Go back to Titus chapter 3. Paul is reminding Titus, and, and certainly he would remind the other Christians in Titus chapter 3, how they were to live and how they were to respond. And he would remind them in verse number 3, Uh, For we also once were foolish ourselves. And earlier, that's why he told them, you be gentle and you do the right thing to others. You be considerate of others. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved of various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. 
Who deserves salvation when you fall into that category? No one. Now watch what he says. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's how good God is, brethren. Even when we were ungrateful and wicked, didn't want to have anything to do with God, he still gave us opportunity and time to make sure that we could get right with him. And if you have put on Christ in baptism, my friend, you need to be thankful for the mercy of God because he is kind even to those who are ungrateful and wicked. None of us deserve his mercy. None of us deserve his goodness. And none of us deserve the forgiveness of sins that he's offered us. And yet, we still get to enjoy it. We get to truly enjoy what it is that really matters in our life. His mercy and the son's mercy is too hard for me to even truly fathom. But if you have received the gift of salvation, you have the greatest gift. You don't get anything during the holiday season, you're just okay. You're still rich. Because if you have salvation in Jesus Christ, then my friend, you truly have everything. That's reason for us to rejoice. And that is our motivation when you go back to Luke chapter 6. When you go back to Luke chapter 6 and verse number 35, remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 35. I'm sorry, and I'm in the Gospel of John. No wonder it didn't look right. In Luke chapter 6, there I am. In verse number 35, you love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. You see what he said? This is, this is, who, the, this is who we serve. And as sons of the Most High, that's who we are supposed to look like. We are to bear his image. We are his children, and so we don't act just any way. Rather, as he said in verse number 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. That's the application. That's the take home. These are our marching orders. We are to be full of mercy. Who are we to be merciful towards? All men. That's what Jesus is trying to get across when you turn over to Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, when a man asked him a, a question in Luke chapter 10, the lawyer stood up in verse 25 and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read? And they would have this conversation. In verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You see, Jesus had told him, you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and you treat your neighbor as you want to be treated. And so he would tell this story in verse number 30 of a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and, and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he's going to go through all of this. And he said in verse 26, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. That's who we're supposed to be. We're to be merciful to all individuals. And I think in every sermon since I've been here, as I introduce a theme for the month, I have the same line in my outline. This is where the challenge is. Have you guys heard me say that? Please say yes. I've said it, I think, eight months or nine months in a row. This is where the challenge is. Be merciful. Okay, great. I got it. We'll see you later. It's not always that easy. Be merciful. This is where the challenge really is. Because bitterness and resentment and anger and revenge can quickly creep in and stifle any feelings of mercy we may have had or want to give to someone else. And Jesus said something about that as well. I want to conclude our study this morning by going to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says something powerful. And here's what I want to do. I want us to read this, and I want you to really think about what Jesus is teaching here. Because Jesus is telling us, Ben, you must be merciful. Just as your heavenly Father is merciful. I have received his mercy. 
in his grace, and I have to be merciful to others. And he's saying the same thing to us, to you. In Matthew chapter 18, we find Peter asking Jesus a question. I think this is one of the most powerful stories. In Matthew chapter 18, in verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything like he really could. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Much, he had a much greater chance for paying that than the other guy. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger and handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. You see what Jesus is saying? Peter asked him a question about forgiveness. Rabbis traditionally recommended forgiving another three times. So Peter upped his game. Up to seven times. That's good enough, isn't it, Jesus? Forgiveness should have a limit, right, Jesus? As Christ shows, any attitude that limits forgiveness is far removed from the love that he wants us to have. Peter's proposal, as one man said, was legal and statistical, but Christ rejects this approach and lifts forgiveness into the realm of love. Seventy times seven. And he's not saying that's the limit. He's not saying 490 times. He's using this to stretch Peter and to get him to see that mercy and forgiveness is to be unlimited. It's a way of life. It's not an occasional act, as one man said. It's a permanent attitude. And so he launches into this story about the kingdom of heaven. Compare it to this story. This slave owed his master a huge sum of money. It's been said in the Roman Empire, the talent was the largest monetary unit, and 10,000 was the highest number for which the Greeks had a specific word. He can't get much bigger than that. And in my margin, when you look at this man, that he, the, the money that this slave owed, one talent is equivalent to 15 years of labor. Hey, I promise I'll pay you back. Yeah, right. There's no way he could have ever paid the king back. Never. And he knew what was at stake because it said that along with him, his wife and children would be sold. But I'll pay you back, king. In an astonishing series of events, the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Can you imagine what that man felt? But the story doesn't end there. That slave had another slave who owed him a hundred denarii. 
600,000th of what he actually owed the king. And yet he was angry where he choked the man. And you're going to give him my money. And everybody else heard about this, and they were so disgusted with him. How dare him, who has received so much mercy. And this man was in the same shoes as this man previously was. And I'm not going to show mercy to him. Shame on him. And the story should be very scary for me and for you. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you of each of you who does not forgive his brother from your heart. You see the point of the story? We've been given great mercy, brethren. And that's our motivation to be merciful. So let me ask you this question, and I'm talking to myself too. How do we respond to one another? How will we respond to our spouses and to our children? How are we going to respond to them? Are we going to have a heart of mercy and compassion? Let me tell you this, and I'm preaching to Benjamin Lee right now. How I respond will elicit a response from God. Isn't that a powerful thing to think about? God, the king saw this. How dare you? I showed compassion on you, and you can't show compassion on this guy. God sees my heart, and he sees your heart. And as our father, is he going to be angry or pleased with our hearts? Will he see mercy and compassion and forgiveness? You see, when you look at God, what do we see? From the beginning of time, his mercy has freely flowed to those who are willing to follow him and listen to him and obey him and come back to him. Question for me and for you. Will our mercy continue to flow to others? Be merciful, because our Father in heaven is merciful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, at times I'm embarrassed to approach your throne of grace and mercy, but I'm thankful for your son Jesus and the fact that he is our great high priest. He is a merciful and great high priest. Thank you, God, for your patience and your love towards me. Thank you, Lord, for your patience and love toward all of us. Help us, Lord. Help me and help all of us, Lord, to become more like you. We recognize how awesome it is to truly be sons of the Most High. And so we pray, Lord, that you will help us to guide our hearts or hide these words in our hearts. Help us to examine ourselves, to look in the mirror of your word and to see where we might need to become more merciful and compassionate and forgiving to others. Please, Lord, be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're a Christian, you have received the mercy of God, and that's reason to be thankful. And if you're not a Christian, God is still good, and he's giving you the opportunity right here, right now, to be saved from your sins. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, you're not saved from your sins, and you need to be saved from your sins. And now is the time to receive the mercy of God. He loves you so much. He sent his son to die on the cross. Now, will you receive the free gift of salvation? You don't earn this, but you got to do what God says in his word. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's our invitation to you. If you're subject to it, come now as we stand and ask.